Okay, <clears throat> okay, we're back. Let's talk about uh, this week's chapter in the book. It's called Inside Criminal Law. We're going to talk a lot about where criminal law comes from, uh, what it means to us here in, in the United States, and a little bit of history behind it. We'll talk about some specific terms. We'll talk about the criminal mind and the criminal act, uh, mens rea and actus rea. You'll see a lot of the terms we have in criminal law come from Latin. Let me adjust that a little bit. A lot of the terms we have in criminal law come from Latin. But first off, let's talk about our, where we get our criminal law from. Four sources. Hopefully you read the chapter and you'll, you'll see we had four sources. First one's constitutional law. Let's talk about that one. That's the Constitution of the United States. Uh, written several hundred years ago, I think it's 1891, and yeah, that's a source of our primary source of law, in the United States. So let's just look at one of the uh, the uh, sections of the Constitution. We'll talk about the Bill of Rights. We'll talk uh, a little bit more about the Bill of Rights as we get into uh, search and seizure and stuff like that. But just for now, let's uh, talk about the Bill of Rights and the, and the criminal law. Uh, one of the rights you have, the Fourth Amendment, says that the government can't search your house uh, unless it's based on probable cause and they have to have a warrant. We'll discuss that in depth when we get in the, chapter, in the next chapter with, uh, with the Constitution. So having said that, that's the Constitution of the United States. It's the law of the land. Uh, no other states can, can, can say, hey, you know what, uh, let's make our own little law that says, yeah, the government can search your house. They don't need a search warrant in, uh, say, Texas or uh, Louisiana or someplace like that. They couldn't say that we're going to supersede the Constitution. So the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Then you get into statutory law. Statutory law is the uh, laws that are written down by the states. You know, each, if you, if you know a little bit about, uh, about the way the United States is made up, we're 50 states, but we are united together. However, each state has its own right. So each of the 50 states has the state's rights, and they can write their own, or their own uh, statutory laws. Such as California has its own statute for, for murder, has its own statute for, uh, for brandishing a weapon, uh, its own statute for, for different things, and they vary state from the state. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, maybe you remember back when we talked about the George Zimmerman case and the Stand Your Ground law. Uh, the George Zimmerman case in Florida uh, has a different law. In California, we'll talk about that. Actually, no, we don't talk about that in this class, but... Uh, if you take criminal law class AJ 103, you'll talk about the uh, fact that if you are confronted with danger, you're required to retreat in California, whereas in Florida, you're not required to retreat. Uh, you're required to, you're given the option of standing your ground, in other words, and, and, uh, and taking on the criminal. Lost my place here. Next one is administrative law. Administrative law looks at, uh, at things such as... Uh, regulations and codes. Uh, if you want to have a business in, uh, say, in Torrance, that's where the college is located. If you want to have a business in Torrance, you have to go down to the uh, city council and they have some regulations on where you can put your your business and what kind of business you can have. Those are called zoning laws. So those are some kind of administrative laws. Uh, let me back up a little bit about the Constitution. There's a thing called case law. And what case law is, is an is a interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, we'll talk about Miranda in depth when we get in a couple of chapters here, but just real briefly right now, Miranda is a good example of case law. Uh, Constitution, I said, it was written in uh, about 1781 or so, when the Constitution was written, and uh, they put in the, one of the amendments was the Fifth Amendment, which said that the person can't be compelled to testify against themselves. In other words, they, they don't have to give a statement to the police whenever they're Please question them. Now, the Miranda decision came out in uh, 1966. Uh, so I asked my students, I say, uh, between 1781 and 1966, did people have the right to remain silent? And a lot of them go, oh, no, no, they didn't, no. Well, they did. The only difference was, in 1966, the United States Supreme Court decided, hey, you know what, we should make the officers tell the people about uh, the right to remain silent. So that's how that case law came down. And we'll, again, we'll discuss Miranda more in depth in a later chapter. The next subject we want to talk about are the different classifications of crime. 
general classifications in crime. And those are two, again, two Latin words, mala in se and mala prohibita. Now, mala in se is basically, as a, as a society, we've decided, or, or, you know, human nature is, there are certain things that are just plain wrong. Uh, you can't kill somebody, you can't uh, steal their stuff, uh, stuff like that, sexual assault, rape, those are just all wrong things to do. And those are mala in se crimes, a Latin term. The next category of crimes are called mala prohibita crimes. And those are crimes that are made illegal by statute. Uh, they're not inherently wrong, they're just made illegal by statute, uh, such as prostitution. There's nothing uh, inherently wrong with prostitution, but because of the, what it does to society, um, we'll, we'll talk about that more in another chapter. You know, when you have prostitution, you have drugs, disease, uh, a lot of the things that surround it. So we've decided, uh, in California here at least, that prostitution is illegal. Now, some states it's not. You go to, to Nevada, they have legal bro they have legal brothels in Nevada. Another example I like to bring up is driving around with your cell phone. Uh, you know, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that they made it illegal to drive uh, while talking on your cell phone. And if you think about it, 25 years ago, would that have been a law? No, probably not, because there were no cell phones. Actually, there were cell phones, but uh, there weren't really cell phones or radio phones back then. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a newer device, so that's the uh, mala, in, mala prohibita, excuse me. And I always remember it, you know, prohibita, prohibited. Uh, it's prohibited by statute, not by by the mere fact that uh, we that it's inherently wrong. Okay, the next concept we're going to talk about is the the uh, how we determine an act is a crime or actually criminal in, in nature, and you have to have three elements. Actually, have two elements. Three elements. I'm sorry, three elements. Uh, and those make up what's called the body of the crime, or the corpus delecti. Now, it's not the body of the crime, not the, the, the body that's laying on the, on the side of the road or something like that, somebody's been murdered. It's the body, meaning the, the things that make up the crime. So, the, the first part is you have to have a, a guilty mind or a, the mens re. And what that means is a guilty mental set. And then, well, I'll explain that in a minute. And the second one we have is the actus ray, which means that criminal act. And those two must occur together. And when you have those two together, uh, then whatever the finished uh, crime is becomes a crime. So let's go back to the, to the guilty mind, the mens ray, the guilty mind. What that means is you have to intend to do whatever crime that you're doing. Now there's different kinds of crimes. There's general intent and there's specific intent crimes. Uh, say you're driving down the street and you drive through a stop sign and the officer pulls you over and says, didn't you see a stop sign back there? And you say, no, I didn't see the stop sign at all. I didn't, didn't intend to run the stop sign. I never even saw the stop sign. It was hidden by a bush or something. Did you intend to run the stop sign? No. So there's no guilty mind there. However, that's a general intent crime, which means there's no you don't have to specifically intend to run the stop sign in order to get a citation for it. But look on the opposite end there to murder. Uh, murder is very specific. And there's different levels of homicide in a criminal law class. I'll teach you more about the different levels of homicide. But for murder, for say first degree murder, you need to have that criminal mind. You have to intend to kill somebody. So you have to form that thought, I want to kill that person. And then you have to actually do the actual killing of that person, that's a criminal act. Again, they have to concur together, that's concurrence. And once you have concurrence, you have that corpus delecti, the body of the crime. Those are the, the three things we have to prove in court. Uh, if you were a prosecutor, you'd have to prove it in court to get the conviction on these people. Now, some people ask, well, you know, what happens if I just shoot a gun in the air and it comes down and kills somebody? Uh, I didn't intend to kill anybody, I just shot the gun in the air. Well, that's not murder because you didn't intend to kill the person, uh, but because it's such a reckless act, uh, it's, it's most likely going to end up in a manslaughter conviction because it's so reckless. Uh, you know, the shooting a gun in the air is a reckless. Is anyway, but what I'm trying to say is, whenever you you do something that's so inherently wrong that uh, or so inherently dangerous that it's likely to end up in somebody getting hurt. Uh, um, 
that shows a certain level of intent there. Say you drive your car into a crowd of people. I mean, it's likely if you drive your car into a crowd of people, somebody's going to get hurt. So that shows some sort of intent, even if you didn't intend to uh, kill or hurt a specific person. So you do have that criminal intent, criminal act. Uh, they both concurred together. Uh, and so that's concurrence. And you end up with the body of the crime. Uh, when we get into criminal law, we'll get in a, in a, in a more definite discussion of that. But one of the things I like to bring up is, say you, uh, you're going to rob a bank. So you got the, the men's mindset, you're going to rob a bank. Uh, you drive to the, you go out and buy the gun, uh, you look around the bank a little bit, you drive to the front of the bank, and you look around and you go, eh, you know what, this is a bad idea, I'm not going to do this. And so you leave. Is there a criminal act there? Or is there a crime there? Sorry. There is no crime because you don't have that criminal act part. You've only got the mental, mental the uh, guilty mind, but not the, the uh, criminal act. Uh, however, if you walk into the bank and hang around a bit and then decide maybe to leave, you might yeah, be able to be tried for an attempt because you've made substantial progress. Again, that's beyond the scope of this class, but if you get into criminal law, you can talk more about that. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, concept of causation and uh, harm. Um, the criminal act must have caused some kind of harm. So in other words, the uh, I go up to somebody to, to rob them, and I point a gun at them and say, give me all your money, and you say, I got no money. And I go, oh, well, put the gun back away and walk away. Have I committed a robbery? No, I haven't committed a robbery because I didn't get any money out of the deal. Uh, maybe if I got your wallet and ran away and your wallet was empty, that would be a robbery because I have to actually got your wallet. But you just say, hey, I don't have any money, and you walk away. Now, there's some other issues there. You've got a brandishing of a gun. Um, you might have a, uh, an assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, something like that. But you don't have a robbery because of, you don't have that act of taking the money away. Yeah, there was no harm that was caused. Another thing is is, is a liability of accomplices. Say you're gonna go go back to the bank robbery scenario. You're gonna rob the bank. You recruit a friend of yours, yours to drive a the getaway car. Uh, you drive down to the bank. Uh, you get out, go in, rob the bank, get back in the car, drive away. The guy that's driving the getaway car is just as guilty as robbing the bank as you are. So that's a accomplice liability. Alright, the next discussion we're going to have are criminal defenses. So the person does the crime, gets arrested, and ends up uh, going to court. And what they can do is they can defend themselves. They can say, hey, I didn't do it, and these are why. And there's two different kinds of defenses that most people that are, that are used. One is called excuse defenses, and the other ones are called justification defenses. And we'll talk about each one. Let's start off with the, uh, the defense excuses. Um, Intoxication can be a defense. It's rarely used because intoxication is normally it's a it's voluntary. In other words, you go out and get drunk just for the mere fact you went out and got drunk and, and shot your your friend doesn't uh, just allow you to justify that crime or to use that uh, defense that you, that you uh, uh, couldn't have formed a criminal intent to do the crime. Uh, however, it's, if it's an involuntary intoxication such as a date rape drug or something like that, that could be used as a as a uh, uh, Defense. And go back a little bit here. Infancy. And people think a little baby. Well, it's sort of like that. Basically, infancy says that um, at certain ages, um, youngsters can't form that intent to do a crime. If a five year old picks up a gun and fires it at somebody, do you think they have the criminal intent to kill somebody? No, it's usually just an accident or a mistake of, uh, mistake of what this thing is. Uh, however, uh, a 10-year-old, maybe, yeah, they can do that. Now, there's no set age limit. Um, it's up to the courts to decide whether or not the person has a, a uh, the, the, uh, a mental ability to form the, the men they're, they're old enough in, in their mind to, to form a, that intent to do the crime. Another time they use that is if you have somebody that's, uh, that's mentally disabled, and they may be in years age, you know, 30, 35 years old, but they may have the mind of an 8 or 9 year old. In that case, could they form the intent to do the crime? Uh, again, it's up to the court to decide, uh, but most likely not. 
Next set of defenses are the uh, justification defenses. In other words, uh, I did the crime. You admit, yeah, I did the crime, but it's justified for this reason. Uh, necessity is one defense. If I didn't do the crime, something worse was going to happen. Uh, uh, a case I worked on once was we were sitting outside of a park. Uh, as we were at arresting a drunk driver, and all of a sudden this guy came barreling out of the park really fast uh, in his car. And so we flagged him in, and he was drunk. And he said, I was only driving drunk to get away from some people who were trying to beat me up. And the story was, as he'd gone to this park, uh, he was a parolee, uh, unfortunately for him. He was a parolee. He'd gone to this park with his uh, wife and kid and his neighbors, um, um, neighbor and their kids. And they'd run out of food. And so um, the wife went with the neighbor to go and the kids to go buy something. He's in the park uh, hanging out with, with with their barbecue and stuff like that. He's a gang member. Rival gang members come in the park. They see him, uh, threaten to beat him up. He runs away, tries to run away, can't get away. So he jumps in his car and takes off and uh, encounters a California Fire Patrol sitting on the side of the road. So, so we uh, we arrested him and took him in, but we also sent the officers in the park to do a little investigation. And yeah, these couple witnesses says, yeah, we saw these... This guy's chasing that guy around. We wonder what was going to happen, and he jumped in the car and took off. We didn't know. We figured he got away. So that would be a justification, a necessity defense. I had to do it. You know, justification, necessity defense. Another one is entrapment. Now this is a a lot of students have a lot of trouble understanding entrapment. But basically, what entrapment is is the police have to induce you to commit the crime. Now people say, well, you know, what about those undercover drug buys where somebody comes in and says, hey, I'll sell you some marijuana, you buy the, buy the marijuana. Are they inducing you to do the crime? No, they're just providing the opportunity for you to do the crime. They're not inducing you to do the crime. But say you were a regular law-abiding citizen, like I know all of you are, and I were a police officer, and I come to you and I said, hey, will you sell some marijuana for me? And you said, no, no, not at all. And uh, I said, tell you what, if I pay you $10,000 for every joint you sell, uh, then will you sell some marijuana for me? And you go, well, ten thousand dollars for every joint. That yeah, makes a lot. Of, you know, okay, I'll try that. You know, I've at that point I've induced you to do the crime. You didn't have the the intent beforehand to do the crime, but I've induced you made up based on the what I just told you to do the crime. Look at my notes here. Self defense. That's a huge one. Uh, you get people that get into fights. Uh, you get husband and wife stuff like that. They claim that, hey, if I didn't defend myself, uh, then, you know, I, I would have been hurt worse. So I defended myself, and in my defense, I ended up hurting somebody. <clears throat> now, in California, uh, again, as I mentioned before, we have that retreat law. You have to do a reasonable retreat. So you're in a room, somebody comes in, there's a door on the opposite side of the room. Um, you can't use a defense, a, a defense justification um, self-defense justification without at least trying to escape. However, the only place you're not required to escape is in your house. Somebody breaks into your house, uh, they're fair game. You know, do what you need to do to, to stop the threat in, uh, in, and uh, defend yourself. Uh, next one is duress, which means that, that um, you'll suffer bodily harm if, uh, if you don't do the crime. There's an example in the book, the guy with the bomb, they, they, the people strapped a bomb to this guy, a uh, regular law-abiding citizen that strapped a bomb to him, told him to go rob the bank. If he didn't rob the bank, he was going to make the bomb blow up. So he goes in the bank and says, somebody strapped this bomb on me, and uh, goes in the bank and comes out. Unfortunately, it didn't end well for him anyway. Uh, but that's just uh, that's another defense. So these are all defenses you can use in court. Uh, you're basically saying, yeah, I did the crime. However, this is why I did the crime, a defense. All right, let's talk briefly about civil law and criminal law. Uh, two different kinds of laws. Uh, in criminal law, well, there's a burden of proof. In other words, the jury has to prove, excuse me, the jury, the, uh, the uh, prosecution has to prove to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that you are, in fact, uh, guilty of a crime. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the trial about uh, what the standard of reasonable doubt is. Um, but it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil trial, they just have to prove that the preponderance of the evidence showed that 
whatever you did, whatever whatever's alleged occurred. And what a preponderance of the evidence is, is say you have a bucket of sand, and they're both even, I mean exactly even weights, uh, uh, down to the you know microgram, and you take one grain of sand out of another one of those buckets and put it in the other one, that's preponderance of the evidence. Just a tiny bit more weight, uh, preponderance of the evidence, to show that it happened. Now, one of the good examples I love to talk about is the O.J. Simpson trial. For those of you not familiar with the O.J. Simpson trial, O.J. Simpson was a uh, former football player, uh, standout at USC, Southern California here. Uh, played football for a number of years, running back, set a lot of records. Uh, uh, was one of my favorite football players uh, growing up. Uh, he also became an actor. Uh, not a great actor, but he was an actor in a couple of movies. Uh, did that for a while. Uh, he was married, He, uh, him and his wife separated, and she ended up being found murdered, and he was arrested for her murder. Uh, now, the LAPD botched the investigation, basically, uh, and there's a lot of other issues going on, but they basically botched the investigation. O.J. Uh, Simpson had the means to uh, appoint a number of lawyers to represent him. Uh, they called him the Dream Team, Johnny Cochran, uh, F. Lee Bailey, uh, and anyway, uh, Kardashian, but they uh, had a, he had a dream team of uh, lawyers representing him, and he convinced their the uh, they were unable to convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty, and so he was acquitted of the murder. Uh, if you want to do some research on that, it's a pretty famous case. Some of you, actually, most of you probably heard it, but probably don't know the details behind it. But it's a pretty interesting case. However, the parents of one of the, the two murder victims uh, sued O.J. Simpson in civil court, saying that, you know, you, you caused the death of our, of our child, and we're suing you in civil court. And so the civil court, remember, the burden of proof is different. So in the civil court, they were able to prove that there was enough evidence that O.J. Simpson killed uh, the, the Goldman, that that was the, uh, the second person that was killed in the murder. There was enough evidence to, to kill Goldman, that the preponderance of the evidence shows he did it, so they found him guilty. Now, can you go to jail on a criminal on a civil charge? You can go to jail on a criminal charge, most definitely. If you get convicted of murder, you'll you're probably going to end up in jail. Civil, though, they can't put you in jail. The only thing they can do is is a, a couple things you can they can do, but the main thing is to get whatever assets they're looking for. Uh, most times, it's some kind of money. Sometimes it's, it's actual property. Every once in a while, in a civil, you'll have a civil case where you get what's called specific performance. Um, basically what that means is whatever you were supposed to do, you didn't do, and they sued you for, you have to do, such as uh, build a house or uh, uh, sell a car or something like that. But that's, that's rare. It's mainly, mainly it's monetary damages they look for. So the Goldman's won some monetary damages from O.J. Simpson, including his Heisman Trophy he got when he, when he won in college, uh, a couple of other things. So that's the difference between criminal law and civil law. All right, another one of the concepts we discussed in this chapter is called due process. And what due process is, and we've discussed it earlier also, is due process is a constitutional requirement that the, uh, the law be followed by the government. Uh, in other words, the Constitution is very clear, and, and you know, prior to watching this video, you'll, you'll have seen a video called the Bill of Rights. Uh, talks about the, the first ten amendments of the Bill of Rights. By the way, did you like that video? It's called kind of a cute little rap video. Every time I play it in the classroom, uh, people walking in the hall stop and look in and, and see on it. And number two, it gets stuck in your head too, which is kind of a drag, but it's there. Anyway, the Bill of Rights lays out uh, what the government has to do uh, in a criminal case. Uh, when you get arrested, uh, they have to provide you bail, they have to take you to trial right away, they have to tell you who, what the charges are, they have to um, provide you a, a defense attorney if you don't have one, uh, they can't force you to testify. Uh, they can't come search your house without a search warrant. A uh, number of things. There's a number of rules the government has to, to follow. And the 14th, 14th Amendment basically says that these are the rules. The rules apply to everybody. And if the government doesn't follow the rules, uh, they can file a writ, what's called a writ of habeas corpus, which it says basically the government hasn't followed the rules and, and you should let me go. And uh, so... Due process says the government has to follow the rules.